America's National Parks, defining preservation in a growing nation. When Europeans came to America, they looked at a large frontier of wilderness and viewed it as theirs to conquer because of manifest destiny, meaning they were entitled to it. There was an abundance of resources here, and they were needed to supply America's growing nation. However, by the late 1800s, over half of the hardwood forests and most all of the wild prairies were gone because of overuse. This loss of so much beauty angered many. Poets such as Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau, and John Muir realized that these scenic landscapes were not infinite and they were some of the first who spoke of parks and preservation. John Muir said, Everybody needs beauty as well as bread, places to play in and pray in, where nature may heal and give strength to body and soul alike. As more natural beauty was found out west and publicized, the idea of preserving these places became more popular. In 1864, the national park idea came to be. The federal government passed legislation to give Yosemite Valley and Marisposa Big Tree Grove to the state of California so it could be preserved for future generations. Next, expeditions were led deep into the territories of Montana and Wyoming in the late 1860s. When those on these trips return, they publicized their discoveries of natural beauty. This led to many wanting to preserve these places. Many powerful people came together to make Yellowstone a national park. The Northern Pacific Railroad viewed Yellowstone as a potential tourist spot. Preservationists also strongly supported the bill. In 1872, Congress created the world's first national park. They set aside over one million acres as a public park and pleasuring ground for the benefit and enjoyment of the people, as they said. Congress followed Yellowstone with creating more national parks during the 1890s and early 1900s. They created Sequoia National Park and Yosemite National Park in California, Mount Rainier National Park in Washington, Crater Lake National Park in Oregon, and Glacier National Park in Montana. Then, in 1906, Congress passed the Antiquities Act. This act gave presidents the ability to create landmarks and other places of historic or scientific interest as national monuments. President Theodore Roosevelt, an early advocate for the parks, took advantage of the act and made 18 national monuments. The creations of these parks created a question. Could you both preserve and enjoy a place? In the early days of the parks, the answer was no. Poachers killed wildlife. People searching for souvenirs destroyed nature. Roads and railroad tracks, homeless people, and builders plagued the early parks. The military was put in charge of these parks then. Soldiers enforced laws against hunting, grazing, timber cutting, and vandalism. Army engineers built roads and buildings. Since the military was lacking in its protection, and since there was no organization capable of protecting the parks, they were standing on thin ice. The conservationists of the utilitarian school wanted use of the natural resources. They wanted to dam rivers and mine the parks. This differed from the views of strict preservationists. When San Francisco wanted to dam Hetch Hetchy Valley in Yosemite National Park in 1913, Congress allowed it. Some say this was the worst disaster to ever come upon a park. The strict preservationists called the Rape of Hetch Hetchy. This was the tip of the iceberg that showed an organization was needed to be in charge of safekeeping the national parks. Then came Stephen Mather, who was a wealthy Chicago businessman that loved the outdoors. He complained to Franklin Lane, who was the Secretary of the Interior at the time that the way the parks were being administered wasn't working. Lane offered him a job and Mather accepted. Horace Albright became Mather's assistant. These two men convinced many that a National Parks Bureau was necessary. In the summer of 1915, they made the first of many trips through some of the national parks with journalists, congressmen, and scientists. 
so they could see the valley of these parks with their own eyes. The press that went on the trip then wrote how wonderful the parks were. Gilbert Grosvenor of the National Geographic Society made the entire April 1916 issue about the parks. Congress also responded to the trip and shortly thereafter, President Woodrow Wilson signed the law creating the National Park Service on August 25, 1916. Mather was made the first director of the National Park Service, and Albright became assistant director as well. However, Mather was soon hospitalized for his depression, which he battled through the years. This left Albright in charge to organize this new organization and attract visitors. During the early years of the service, the goal was to get people to the parks. This led to questionable policies. Bears were fed garbage as entertainment. Predators were killed so visitors could see more popular animals such as deer and elk. Mountain lakes were stocked with German brown trout for fishermen. No one thought of there being negative consequences. After all, words such as biosphere or ecosystem were not even words yet. Neither was the ideas behind them. Through the 1920s, the National Park Service was mainly in the West. In the early 1930s, Albright decided that the parks must be in the east as well, so the service wanted to preserve historic sites and memorials as well. In 1933, Franklin Roosevelt signed an executive order that made this a reality. Then the Great Depression hit, and Roosevelt ga gave people work by having them build new roads, trails, and buildings throughout the parks. Then, in World War II, most parks were closed. People wanted to take the natural resources from the parks during this time for the war effort. The parks held strong except for some grazing of animals. This was a win for the preservationists. The National Park Service finally withstood a test, setting them on track to finally be preserved without disturbance. Post-war, many people now had an automobile, and the parks took off. However, the parks being neglected during the war, they need to be updated. National Park Service Director Conrad Worth proposed Mission 66 in 1956 to combat these issues. The goal was to modernize all roads, bridges, trails, visitor centers, and employee housing by the 50th anniversary of the National Park Service in 1966. This was successful, and the parks were ready for increasing numbers of visitors. Throughout the 60s and 70s, new types of parks were created, such as National Sea Shores and Lake Shores, as well as many urban parks. Then, in Alaska, more national parks were created. This more than doubled the total acreage of the entire national park system. Since then, the National Park Service has been continuing to preserve land for generations to come. This was a truly American idea and has since reached all inhabited continents around the world. Never before was there something like this. The barrier has been broken on conservation thanks to American preservationists and those around the globe who followed suit.